Hi friends, today we are going to see a prerequisite for a wave theory and propagation. So to understand wave theory and propagation, we need some basic uh, mathematics uh, which to be known in prior. So without worrying or without understanding or without assuming that you might be already done this in your math courses, we will be taking uh, the required uh, mathematics uh, for the, uh, that I required in the subject. So we'll be taking that in the uh, in this uh, module. So this module named as vector calculus. So today we are going to start with vector calculus and this module basically contains a huge amount of mathematical equations. But we will try to analyze this using some basic physical phenomena so that you can visualize the vector fields. The concept will start with a basic understanding on what do you mean by vectors. That is a basic fundamental question. How I should have an algebra and basic algebra for vectors. That is the second question we will be dealing with. The third question that I'm going to deal with is how to visualize vectors. Okay, so this basic uh, phenomena uh, are going to be uh, catered in this uh, video. Let us start with the first topic that is definition of vectors but before def defining a vector i would like to uh, take an example or just wanted to uh, consider that what uh, level of uh, understanding we have so far developed for the term called vectors okay so let's say that I have a physical phenomena or a physical quantity and I wanted to measure that physical quantity. That physical quantity could be uh, a weight or a mass or time or pressure or force or velocity or acceleration and many more. So I have some physical phenomena and I wanted to measure that physical phenomena. Now what has happened is all this physical phenomena was being measured and we know the measurements a lot okay but just think that what could be the initial stage of uh, deriving the units for measurements so if we go back in history and think of how they would be thinking when they are going to they have found some new phenomena and they wanted to give the unit to that phenomena so the first and foremost thing comes to our mind is what all things are required to specify this phenomena is a magnitude is enough to specify the phenomena or along with the magnitude we require a direction also so based on this two broader classifications or two broader categories were developed one which have only magnitude okay so one broader category is having some physical phenomena which have only magnitude that means magnitude is sufficient to specify everything about that quantity if i say one kg it is everything specified or one kg mass is enough to specify everything about that physical phenomena okay then i will uh, and then we have also a uh, phenomena wherein along with magnitude direction was also very important now, for example, a person says that I have, I have jogged for, let's say, one kilometer. Okay, I have, I, I did jogging in the morning for one kilometer. Will you ask him that in which direction you went? No, it is sufficient for you to analyze that, okay, one kilometer distance he has traveled. In which direction we are not respectfully asking for that we only know that he has jogged for one kilometer 
So I have mentioned the distance, but I have not given the direction. And one kilometer was a sufficient data to measure the distance. So if I say a distance between two points, direction is not mandatory. I just need to specify what is the magnitude. One kilometer is the magnitude. So distance is a quantity, okay, is a physical quantity, which I can only specify using magnitude. No direction is required. But if I say that my school or my college or my university is two kilometers away from my home. And all of a sudden on one day I got up early in the morning and I started walking two kilometers. Will I reach my university? Because if you start walking two kilometers, there is a freedom for you to walk in three dimensions or in all possible dimensions. There are many. You can go up, you can go right, you can go left, you can start northeast, you can start northwest, you can start infinite. You can start digging down also two kilometers. How does it really matter? But specifying only that two kilometers from the home does not really gives you the complete sense of direction and you will never reach your destination. You will start walking two kilometers every morning and you will end up going in different directions every day. But if I say that you go five kilometers straight, sorry, you go 0.5 kilometers straight. After 0.5 kilometers, take a right, go further 10 to 20 steps ahead and so on and so forth. If you combine that two kilometers along with the direction, then surely you will reach your destination. So what is happening? I am specifying the distance, but along with the distance, now the requirement is the direction. So some physical phenomena really cannot be explained only using the dimensions or only using the magnitude, but it requires direction also. For example, I say that is gravity pull. So if I say gravity pull, you can immediately get a direction sense that it is towards the ground. Why? Because someone has told you that gravity pull towards the ground. So you will see an arrow going downwards towards the earth. So when I say gravity, you know it's a force, but that force is exerted downwards. So when I, when I wanted to throw an object upwards, I need to always think that there will be a downward force acting also, which is through gravity. So gravity requires the direction as well as the magnitude. As you go more and more away from the uh, earth, your gravity pull will be becoming more stronger. After one point, the gravity will stop acting onto you and you are in vacuum or space. Right? So this is how we specify the quantities. We are distinguished, we have distinguished quantities under whether they require magnitude alone to specify or they require magnitude as well as direction to specify themselves. Based on these categories or based on this broader classification, we have named them as scalar quantities and vector quantities. So we have only magnitude quantities called as scalar quantity and only uh, and magnitude and direction quantities are called as a vector quantities. So how can I define vector quantity? Vector quantities are those physical quantities which require magnitude as well as direction to specify them completely. Whereas scalar quantities are those physical quantities which requires only magnitude to specify completely. For example, mass is a scalar quantity. Then we can have time as a scalar quantity. Okay, as I gave you example of distance is a scalar quantity. Right, so these are all what the scalar quantities are all about. Vector quantities are, for example, says force. Okay, then velocity, then acceleration. These are all uh, examples of vector quantity, which needs direction as well as uh, magnitude. Now, since we have defined the definition of vectors, 
Now we will understand how to represent a vector. So now we have understood what do you mean by uh, vectors. So let us understand how to visualize a vector. So to visualize a vector, I need to have the sense of directionality as well as uh, the sense of magnitude. So how we normally define or how we normally represent a vector is by showing an arrow. So the arrow head denotes the direction. So the arrow head denotes the direction and the size of the line or the size of the segment or the length of the segment actually defines its magnitude. So if suppose I have a 10 Newton of force then let's say I draw it like this this is let's say 10 Newton of force in a particular direction let's say in the direction or uh, towards the uh, right and I say there is a 5 uh, Newton of force which is in the direction left then I would have drawn a smaller segment with an arrow head going towards the left with 5 Newtons so this is the way we represent a, a, a vector so we have an arrow head and we have a segment size. So in general, whenever I denote a vector, I normally we normally uh, also use a symbol of making an arrow on the uh, segment in which what it says is the arrow head points the direction and again the segment size will uh, denote the magnitude. But various time it really becomes cumbersome for us to uh, keep the track of what is the scale that we have used for vectors. So what we normally do is the magnitude of the vector will be written on the segment and irrespective of its size and we will always show the uh, arrow to denote the direction. So magnitude will be denoted using numbers, direct numbers on the segment and direction will be used, uh, show, uh, displayed using uh, arrow heads. So this is how we will be uh, denoting a vector. Now let's say uh, how to represent a vector. So now vector as I said that it has a direction as well as a magnitude. So a vector A, okay, a vector A, let's say normally denoted algebraically like A bar, okay, A bar onto it is represented as a magnitude of vector a into a direction of vector a so this we will see in more detail what does this mean or this you can also find it from here a a cap is equal to vector divided by the magnitude of the vector itself so the magnitude of the vector will be given by the vector quantities directly so if I divide the vector itself by its magnitude, the value or answer will give me what will be the magnitude of this division. The magnitude of this division will be 1. So this vector has a special name and even the symbol I have de de denoted is very special. I have not used a bar onto it, but I have used a, a cap onto it. So that unit vector, the vector has a special name which we called as a unit vector. So this vector has a special characteristics or a special name which we call as a unit vector. So this will help us in finding the direction of a vector. The unit vector will help us in uh, deciding or showing the direction of the vector. And this will give me the magnitude of a vector. So modulus of a bar will give me the magnitude and unit vector will define the direction. So algebraically when I write a vector, I will write a vector in two terms. One is the uh, modulus and the unit vector. And the unit vector is given as a vector divided by a uh, modulus of a vector. And how to calculate modulus of a vector that we will see in a moment when we will deal with coordinate systems. Now let's say that I have two vectors and 
I have two vectors, let's say vector number A, okay, A vector, and I have another vector, which is let's say vector number or vector B of some magnitude and some direction. Now both are in the same direction. Now the question is, what will be vector A plus vector B? Okay, of course vector A plus vector B, the result will be vector C. Then why, how should we calculate this sum? That is A vector plus B vector. And with this, we have successfully entered into what is called as vector algebra. So, so in the vector algebra, the first problem that we have taken is if I have two vectors and I wanted to add them, how will I add them? So there are basically two rules to add these vectors. One is called as a triangle law or head tail law and one is called as a parallelogram law. So let us understand what is this head tail law and parallelogram. So we are going to see first law as we call as triangular law or we called also called it as head tail law and the second one is the parallelogram law. Okay, so let us see how uh, this will happen or how, how this will actually be taken. So let's say I have a vector A and a vector B. So I draw a vector A. And let's say at some tilt angle, I have this vector B is going like this. This is vector B and this is vector A. And I wanted to add them both. In head tail or in the triangular law, what I will do is I will shift this vector, okay, or I will keep the tail of the vector on the head of the second vector. So if I will take this vector with the same tilt and will drag it up to the head of A, it will come somewhere here, and then this becomes my b vector so this is my vector b this is a tail of b vector and this is a head of b vector so initially both the tails are uh, at the same point now what i did is i dragged my uh, b vector up to the head of a vector and then i will draw a resultant which joins the tail Tell tail of the A to the head of the B. Okay, so what I'm saying is this is my resultant, let's say R. So instead of saying that going from here to here is the same as going from this to this point, isn't it? So that will the resultant will be A bar plus B bar. This is called as a head tail rule of vector addition. So this I can write it like this R vector R will be equal to A bar plus B bar. Okay. So in this we used the drag principle on a vector. We dragged it up to the head of the next uh, vector. And then we have joined the tail to the head of the two vectors. Next is a parallelogram vector or a parallelogram addition rule in which again I consider two vectors going in the similar points likewise. So this is vector number A and this is vector number or vector B. Now what I do is I drag this and bring the tail of the B vector onto the head of A vector, which will be over here, and I will place my scale onto A 
and drag this vector up to the head of B. Okay, so it will form a parallelogram. Okay, so I missed my calculation. It should be up to A. So it's joined each other. This will be A. Now, this has formed a parallelogram with this vector is my B and the above vector is my A. And the resultant is nothing but the, uh, the resultant is the diagonal of this parallelogram. Right? So this is my resultant R vector. Where the R vector is nothing but A bar plus B bar. So for addition of vectors, we have two laws. One we called as a parallelogram law and second one we called as head, head to tail law. So the resultant will be calculated very easily using this two law. More often we will be using uh, the head tail law and very frequent uh, and not much frequently we'll be using parallelogram because that gives me a benefit of only uh, dragging one vector here we have to drag two vectors now the next question is we have added two vectors how to subtract two vectors so i wanted that the resultant now should be a bar minus b bar so for a bar minus b bar that is for subtracting a bar with b bar we don't have to actually have a separate law but what we can do is i can shift or i can just flip the direction of b and my a vector okay if it is going in one direction i can say that the b is going in the second direction by saying that it is minus b that is flipping the direction of vector b and then if i perform the resultant as a bar plus minus b bar then it is actually a subtraction of two vectors so when i wanted to subtract two vectors it is just because the direction of the vectors are opposite and i'm going to add them so when i add two vectors if the direction are not the same they are going to subtract if the directions are same then they are going to add Okay, so there's no separate law for subtraction. We can use the head tail law or parallelogram law only with the flip of the uh, vector direction. Now, the major question is how to perform vector multiplication. So the next question, which is very important in vector algebra is vector multiplication. Vectors are multiplied using two methods and which are very frequently used in this total subject. One is we called as a scalar product or scalar multiplication. And second, we called as we call it as vector product. So we have a scalar product and we have a vector product. Now, what do you mean by scalar product? Scalar product is also called as a dot product or some books refer to dot product and can be called as scalar product and vector product is called as a cross product. So I have two products one is called as a scalar product and one is called as a vector product. Now what is what do you mean by scalar product or dot product and what do you mean by vector product and cross product. So let us take the first one is a scalar product, which I also called it. We also called it as a dot product in which if let's say I have a vector A and a vector B. This is vector A and a vector B and they are making certain angle between them, which is theta. Okay, then vector a dot vector b is equal to magnitude of vector a magnitude of vector b 
into cosine of theta. Now this is very important. What trigonometric function I'm using? I'm using the function of cosine theta. Here, just to recall, cosine theta is equal to 1 for theta equals to 0 degrees and equals to 0 for theta equals to 90 degrees. Right? That is just to recall for the cosine. Suppose if I say that the vectors are parallel, what does it mean? Vector A is parallel to vector B. It means that the angle between them is 0 degree. Here, I can emphasize and say that angle theta is equal to 0 degree. And if angle is 0 degree, cosine value is 1. That means you will get the maximum answer for the A dot B. And in this case, A bar dot B bar will be equal to magnitude of A bar into magnitude of B bar. Correct? Because cosine theta is 1. Then, if I wanted to find what will be the dot product, of two vectors which are perpendicular to each other or making an angle of 90 degree. That means one vector going like this and the second vector is perpendicularly either going up or incident onto it by making an angle of 90 degree. Okay, let's say this is vector A, this is vector B and the angle that they make is theta is equal to 90 degree. That time the A bar dot B bar product a bar dot b bar product will be equal to 0. Isn't it? Because they are perpendicular to each other. But then you will understand, you will ask why, why are we actually studying this? Why, what is the basic significance of this? The basic significance of a dot product is to find the projection of vectors. It is simple as understanding that how much one vector put its shadow on the second one. For the case, let's say, if I consider this vector, this configuration, where certain angle theta is being produced, what is going to happen? This much length or this much distance, the vector is going to put its shadow, right? Depends on what all things, depends on the size of this vector. That means the magnitude of the vector depends on this magnitude of the vector. If this magnitude is this much, there will be 100% overlap of the uh, A by the B, but B will not be 100% overlap. There will be some portion of B, right? So magnitude of A is important. Magnitude of B is important and the angle between them. If they are 180 degree, that means if it is going like Y is, what will be the shadow or what will be the projection? Okay, so this way, okay, we will define the dot product. It says that uh, how much shadow or how much projection of the one vector on the other is found using dot product. So I can say that if I wanted to check whether the vectors are parallel, I can use dot products. A dot product will give me parallel vectors, is it? If the dot product is maximum, that means the vectors are completely parallel. If they are not parallel, but making some minimum angle, then they will be more or closer to A bar dot B bar. Isn't it? So this is what the basic physical significance of a dot product. How to see a dot product? Just see how much shadow one vector puts on other. That will give me the dot product. If you see in this case, Vector A and vector B, you can see that vector B is completely covering vector A. So the dot product will be maximum. If you see in this case, vector B will only project itself at one point. Okay, only one point. What will be the shadow? Nothing, because it is standing straight. So the shadow will be like a 12 o'clock. You don't see your shadow. It is exactly at your footsteps. So in this way, the, vector, the dot product will be zero in this case. So when I say dot product, always imagine about the shadow and the projection. Next, we go to a cross product. Now let us analyze how a, a cross product looks like. So the next topic that we will be dealing with a 
cross product or also known as a vector product. Now in case of cross product, again we will consider two vectors, one horizontally and the second one making certain angle theta. This is vector A, this is vector B and then again we will ask the same question what is a bar cross b bar so a bar cross b bar will be equal to magnitude of a bar to magnitude of b bar into sine of theta okay again this is a very important formula okay so just to recall sine theta is equal to 1 at theta is equal to 90 degree and is equal to 0 at theta is equal to 0 degree now let's see if again we will apply the same concept if suppose i have two vectors which are uh, parallel to each other so if they are parallel to each other theta will be 0 so i say that this is vector a and this is vector this is vector a let's say and this is vector b and then between them there is theta is equal to 0 degree because they are parallel in that case what is going to happen is uh, sine of uh, 0 will be uh, 0 and the whole cross product will die or will convert to 0 so if two vectors are parallel the cross product is going to die hmm, that is the first finding in the second finding let us make theta is equal to 90 degree so without using any generalization let us use the same diagram that i say that here the theta is equal to 90 degree what will be the uh, cross product and the cross product will be maximum right it will be a bar dot a bar into b bar but if this two findings if we see that one says that if the if the if the vectors are uh, perpendicular to uh, sorry parallel to each other the answer is zero and if they are perpendicular to each other the answer is maximum the the cross product actually deals with the swirling effect of the of the or we can say uh, the rotational uh, motion of a device or of a uh, vector so it actually needs uh, two vectors like suppose for example i take one vector and swirl another onto it okay swirl another onto it then uh, the cross product will be the if you see the swirling effect the second vector will always be perpendicular at each point to the uh, original vector or the axis we see so in that sense the cross product actually is helpful in understanding what is the swirling effect or how much is this swirling Okay, if there is no swirl, uh, if the two lines are parallel, there is no swirling of the vectors, right? That they are not interlinked to each other. So what is going to happen? The cross product is going to die or kill itself, right? For example, if you take an example of a swirl in a or an eddy current in a water flow, you see that eddy current goes uh, round and round or eddies goes round and round in the water flow. If you see to the bottom of that, you will see one point isn't it so that swirl goes above and above and goes on increasing because the swirling effect will help the uh, cross product to increase isn't it there's a swirl there should be an axis vector which is coming upwards okay and the second vector will be swirling that is the water is swirling around an axis isn't it so axis vector shows the direction of the swirl which is upwards or downwards and then the swirl effect will uh, give you um, the, the, the second vector will tell you how much swirling effect it is and there will be a cross product okay so top spinning is one of the examples screw which we uh, screw in the wall that is an example swirl uh, of uh, in waters that is an example then uh, uh, cyclones are one of the example so these are all the examples of curl or uh, a cross product wherein there is a swirling effect so if there are no swirls cross will be zero if there are swirls the cross will be uh, maximum so this is how uh, vectors are multiplied with each other so for multiplication we have two rules one is a scalar rule and one is a vector rule
so if i have a product called as vector product that means the result should be a vector so i got this result and i got some value okay what is the value that i'm getting is let's say i'm getting the value of the vector to be um, magnitude that i will get is magnitude of a magnitude of b sin of theta correct so this is what we are getting as a whole now how to get the direction of this vector or how to get the direction of the resultant so let us consider that i have a vector a and i have another vector b the meeting point is let's say theta this is vector b okay and i wanted to find what will be the resultant direction so always remember the resultant direction is perpendicular to both the vectors exist for example uh, as you see that the swirling the swirling okay the swirling vector will always be perpendicular to both of them okay both of the uh, vectors which are swirled okay for example see here we will use right hand rule there is no problem with using a left hand rule also you can use left hand or you can use right hand for example i place my hand along right hand along the vector a so i will place my hand along vector a and then i will swirl my fingers or will uh, rotate my wing fingers towards b so what does it mean i kept my hand along a and i swirl to b so this is a cross b so when i say a cross b that means i'm swirling towards b the direction of the resultant vector is given by the thumb so the thumb indicates okay in which direction the resultant will point so you can see that the thumb is pointing outwards which is perpendicular to the sheet of this uh, or the, to this plane or to the uh, paper so always remember when i uh, do cross product of two vectors the resultant will always be perpendicular to them so if these two are the vectors resultant will be perpendicularly coming out or going in okay now when it will come out and when it will go in if i have a cross b then you have seen the swirl will bring it out but if we have b cross a then i will align my hand towards b and swirl my finger towards a and you can see that the, uh, the finger the thumb denotes downwards so here we have to note a very important point that if i have a bar cross b bar and if i have b bar cross a bar as both are vectors magnitude will be the same but direction will be opposite to indicate the directionality opposition we close a minus sign so a cross b is equal to minus b cross a because we have to take care of the uh, direction and sine minus will take care of the direction even though the magnitude will not change the direction will surely change because when i say a cross b or b cross a neither the magnitude of the a changed neither the magnitude of b has changed nor the uh, the angle has changed between them so a bar dot b bar sine theta will give the same result for both of them but the direction in which we use the right hand will change hence we have to take care of that directionality and minus sign will indicate in which direction the vector is going the resultant vector will be going but both the cases the resultant vector will always be perpendicular to the plane where two vectors exist if a and b exist on this plane then vector will be perpendicular to this plane it will be above or going down this is what a uh, vector algebra is all about now as we have seen some part of vector algebra let us summarize that we have defined what is a what is a vector so a vector is a quantity which has magnitude and direction both that was the first scenario the second case was uh, how to represent a vector we have used representation
we have used arrows and segments thirdly we have defined some vector algebraic expression in which we have seen what is a bar plus b bar by using head tail and parallelogram methods we have also seen that there is exists a plus minus b bar which is a vector subtraction then we have seen there is something called as a bar dot b bar which is nothing but magnitude of a bar into magnitude of b bar cosine theta and lastly we have seen that a bar cross b bar is equal to magnitude of a bar into magnitude of b bar into sine theta so these are the basic concepts in vectors that we have revisited from maths i hope you have understood the vector calculus or the vector algebra and the vectors clearly thank you